Um, one thing I just wanted to say is that a couple of people asked about the public consultation that Llewellyn mentioned during the presentation. Um, we will add details of that to the virtual pack of materials that we will send to you guys after we finish. So it will be early next week, right, Monday, Tuesday. We will send you a link with all the presentations, both the video and the PowerPoint that people have used. So you can go and remind yourself of all of those things. We'll include a couple of extra things, and that will be a link to the public consultation that, that he mentioned in the presentation. Okay? Good. Okay, Isabella. Um, good. So our fourth theme, our penultimate theme, um, biodiversity and offsetting. Um, the usual drill, presentation, a couple of extra comments, and then it'll be over to you guys to discuss. So, um, Kathy. So good morning everyone. If you can't hear, just wave at the back. I'll make sure I hold the microphone up. So I'm Cathy Willis. I'm a professor of biodiversity here in Oxford. But for the last five years, I've also been the director of science at Kew Gardens in London. So I've had a lot of interaction on the whole question of biodiversity. And I also sit on the government's natural capital committee, looking at the role of biodiversity and how it can, I mean, how it can enhance sort of human well-being. But when I started, actually, uh, as the Professor of Biodiversity, which was in 2010, that week there was a large survey, survey of the UK population, and 80% said biodiversity, they thought biodiversity was a washing powder. <laughs> so I realised I'd well and truly had my work cut out, but I thought it would be very helpful just to include this slide in here, because of course when we use the word biodiversity, we're talking about species, about communities, about populations, and about landscapes. Now, of course, there, is, there are huge competing demands on biodiverse land across the world. We keep hearing these extinction rate uh, um, comments coming through, through all these international and national and local reports. And the demands are on there, first of all, we do have our land that was required for wildlife, but we also have land which is required for resource security, for food, for timber, for biofuels. And then we have land required for urban growth and infrastructure, particularly as we talk about Oxford today. And across many sectors, there is a recognition that all three of those are things that we need, and it's working out where those trade-offs are between biodiversity and these other demands on land. And in the UK government's 25-year plan, for example, they have a strong commitment to leave the environment in a better state than it is presently. But how that fits into also our commitment for more houses and more infrastructure is a very uh, topical point. So one of the things that's also come about in the last 10 years, really, is understanding what nature is. We tend to think, when people talk about biodiversity, you tend to think about pretty flowers, you tend to think about butterflies, beautiful landscapes. And very rarely do people put a value on it. It's, it's a free resource. It's a resource we're all entitled to. But of course, nature itself does have a value because it provides really important benefits for all of us. And when you try and cost those benefits, you realise that that's actually very, very valuable. And all of this came about really by the economists, and some in the side business school where we now are today, talking about the economics of biodiversity. Can we put a value on it? So what does that mean? Well, if you look at a landscape like this, I often show this to um, actually my students, and I say, okay, where would you put, if you had to put a fence around this landscape to, to conserve biodiversity, where would you put the fence? I don't know if anyone wants to really see it very clearly, but here we've got trees, got fields, got mountains. So the, the smart ones, the ones that put their hands up immediately, say, well, of course you put it around the trees. But then the ones who thought about it a bit more thinks, well, no, let's put it around this area here, this mosaic habitat of trees and landscapes. And nobody puts their hand up for this bit up here, or this bit down here, or this single tree. But in fact, all of them have a value, because that bit at the bot, bottom there is really important for growing of crops. So the provisioning aspects of biodiversity, the soils in that landscape will determine, often, very often determine the, the productivity of that land. That single tree is actually very important if your crops require pollination, because most pollinators can, can't fly more than two, about one and a half miles. So therefore you need to have pollinating uh, vegetation which they can live in, their habitats, their foraging, near to the crops. This monodominant forest here 
is very important for drawing down, for sequestering carbon dioxide, for climate change mitigation, in order to create extra climates. And the bit at the top is actually very important for those iconic species, like you think about the large birds, but also it's very, very important for recreation. Many people will use those landscapes because they have cultural value to them. So what knowledge then do you need to determine how you split up your landscapes according to that so-called natural capital? And this is very much the work that goes, is going on in the government in terms of natural capital. So you have your natural capital assets, which are your species, your communities, your landscapes. They provide the services that we all rely upon, like your pollination services, your carbon sequestration. And that then underpins the societal benefits that we get from it, a plentiful supply of food, clean water, recreational land. Now, normally, we think of it this way. So we think about where your assets are, what the services are provided, and your societal benefits. But when you're starting to think about competition across land for various different things, you need to look the other way. You need to think, which benefits do we need from nature, and then where should they be, and what nature should it be? So for biodiversity in Oxford, then, we're taking it in this framing what biodiversity do we need to consider in Oxford to mitigate against climate change and, other, and what are the other co-benefits you get from that? Should priority be given to housing infrastructure over biodiversity? In what circumstances should that happen? And is biodiversity offsetting, which is a policy that's come through, which is effectively saying if you are going to build in one area and you can't do anything about the biodiversity, you have to enhance biodiversity somewhere else. Is that offsetting, is that policy correct? Can we really move biodiversity to somewhere else and still get the same benefits? So I thought I'd start with just giving you, this is a satellite imagery of Oxford, and I've put these sort of three, Kidlington, City Centre, Cowley, so you can vaguely orientate yourself. This is, what this is, is it's an imagery of satellite imagery, and it's giving the NDVO, which is photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity that's given off by the vegetation in those blocks. So the greener <coughs> the, the greener the areas, the higher the photosynthetic activity going on in, in, that, in that year. And so immediately, even within Oxford, this is a 30 metre resolution, you can see there are areas that are much more photosynthetically active than others. There's a huge variation across Oxford. That white patch there is there far more, um, in case you're wondering, there's nothing going on there, it's a big pool of water, obviously. <laughs> Okay, so how then, how important is this variation in Oxford when we're thinking about what we should be doing going forward in terms of biodiversity or setting? And are there, and how do we work out what the co-benefits are of these different areas? So the steps you need to do in order to work these things out, first of all, you need to know the nature we already have in Oxford, an environmental census. And the CEO of the City Council, we did talk about this, and he's already thinking this is something that we, as a citizens of Oxford, I live up in a summer town, so I can, one of you. Um, and the next one is, you then need to determine the ecosystem services or the flows from those assets, and then work out whether it is indeed possible to relocate or do you lose the services because you've moved it somewhere else? So I think I'm probably going to link on for us, just looking at the board there, seeing flooding in Oxford was on your board from the previous discussion, so I think I'm sort of leading in here. So this is some work we've done here in Oxford to start to say, OK, which trees are important for reducing flood risk in central Oxford? Because one of the things trees do on a landscape is they capture the water and retain it. Therefore, you get a big storm event, if you've got trees on the landscape, they slow down the rate of water that comes into the river and therefore reduce the flood risk further down in Oxford. And this work we've been doing is actually in the Evenlow catchment. Here's Oxford, just north northwest of us up here. And the question we ask is, what role do the soils and trees play in the Evenlow catchment? Because climate change will bring about an increase in these flooding or this, these short, sharp flood risk rainfall events. To do that, we use a certain amount of modelling. There's one model that's been developed by the Met Office called Jules, and what this model does, it effectively it's a water balance model, and it, uh, it, it, it takes the vegetation and the soil for each pixel within your drainage basin, 13 to pixel, and works out the contribution that you're getting in there from these various um, aspects of the vegetation. So what you do is you run your model with the current land cover for every 30 metres, and then you test it against the, the rainfall that's been measured in, at the mouth of the river. So all our rivers that come into Oxford have got, so you might see them there on the riverbank, you get this thing which is seeing the level of the water. 
And that's what it's doing, it's telling you what the flow of the water and how much water is coming in. And you test it against the model output. So here's your model and you're testing it. Now you can't see it from the back, but you have to believe me here. The grey line in here is the model, the red and the blue are the actual output. It's a very close fitting. So it's saying that actually the model is very, very good at representing the flow of water across the landscape with that current vegetation. So what you do is you then run the model again, but you remove the vegetation. And you say, so what contribution is the vegetation having on water flow regulation in Oxford? And what you come up with is a map. And I'll show you the map on the next slide. And this is the map of the even load catchment. And this not come up very well, but the areas, yeah, the areas that you see in red here, um, the, the, the soil type is, um, is basically behaving like bare soil. So if you want to plant trees, that's the area to plant the trees. The areas in blue are actually really, really important because they are reducing the overland flow. So, if we move on quickly, because I've seen some watching a lot, in here, if you look at Oxford then, the other thing we find is that the some areas of Oxford, <coughs> even loads in here, contribute hugely to our water flow. Other areas don't. So there's no point in planting trees over here and hoping it's going to reduce our flood risk, because it won't. We really need to be concentrating up here. And the other way you can then look at it is how many trees and how much. So what we, this other model did is we add 10, 20 and 15 percent, 25 percent forest, and what we found, if you add forests to those landscapes, this is the amount of, uh, this is the difference, this is the amount of flood that goes down into the river. You get, and this is the difference, the less, small amount of difference, or larger amount down here. This shows you get a big, a big reduction in flood risk by planting those trees. And the more trees you plant in the even low catchment, the better it is at reducing it. But of course, it's not just flood risk we're looking at here. Those trees also provide a lot of other things. And one of the, oh, the slide's gone really wrong, sorry. One of the key things they're providing, are trees that we come back into the city, I'm not sure I can do much more because there's something wrong with my slides here, but anyway. We, one of the things you need to be thinking about, trees in the cities are obviously pollution reduction and even outside of the edges of the cities. Um, you've got these leaf surface hairs on the, on the leaves, that's a really important thing, it captures the particulate matter in the city. And, but then, you, again, you need to know which species and where. This is a lovely study from, uh, from a city in Poland. Look at these two trees. Large tree here, Indian bean tree, small tea tree, dwarf Korean lilac. They measured the amount of particulate matter captured by those two trees. And I thought, well, of course, that huge tree would capture more. Absolutely not. That captured 7.5 milligrams per year. This captured 32 milligrams per year. Really big difference just because you have different species. We know green infrastructure is also very important at reducing the urban heat island effect. So again, it's something to think about. We haven't done this in Oxford, but this has been done in many other cities across the world. And then the last one I want to just touch on before I move on to the summary points is the increased greenness, particularly in cities, is increasingly shown to be really important for mental well-being. And this is a study done by people up at the JR, and they've looked at the UK Biobank, a million participants who have got their medical records in the UK Biobank, and they're geolocated. And what they found is that those people who live in greener areas have better mental health <coughs> outcomes. And so think about that Oxford map. It's not the amount of green, but the shade. So the greener the shade, the better the mental well-being outcome. And the effects are more pronounced amongst these, these groups, but taking that all into account, you still find a very strong relationship. And it's, it's not just in, in the UK, it's also found in these other cities in the world. So just quick, so quick eyeball way we're living uh, in, in Oxford, but it, it is a really important point. So just to summarise then, biodiversity in Oxford and Oxfordshire as a whole is not only nice to have, but it does provide these really essential services to mitigate against, against climate change. But in addition, it has many other co-benefits, and we mustn't lose sight of that. It's not just a one, one shop, that actually that is why if you add all those benefits up, it becomes an incredibly <coughs> valuable resource. Any work undertaken to make climate more, uh, also more climate smart must therefore include a proper consideration of the role of nature. We are far too, the government and the city are far too silent in the thinking, we have housing, we have biodiversity, we have transport. We need to join them together. Um, but when we think about new builds and we think about biodiversity off offsetting, the first step in that has to be no net loss of biodiversity. 
In fact, we should be always be looking to enhance biodiversity and replace. But I think you saw the example of the trees, that not all biodiversity is equal. We tend to think, we can just plant trees, it'll be fine, it'll solve the problem. It won't. We have to be thinking, obviously different trees sequester different amounts of carbon, different trees are much better at capturing particulate matter in the air. We need to be thinking about that. And I just want to, the last point, to take you back to that flood regulation and the even load catchment. If you cut down the trees in the even load catchment and plant trees elsewhere, that won't work. Biodiversity is spatially constrained when you start to think about things like flood regulation. And therefore, in that sense, biodiversity offsetting by itself, when you just think about, well, just move the biodiversity over here, simply won't work as a policy. Thank you.